Okay, um, let's do our last sentence. This one is number 14. Uh, the hint is phonetic reality. Uh, okay, thanks, Professor Steve, for giving us a completely useless clue. What are we gonna make out of that? Uh, who knows, let's try to figure it out from the bottom up without any semantic help or maybe just a little bit of semantic help. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, what do we got to work with here? Um, as usual, the first thing we can usually pick out is um, or are the sibilants. Um, I always get confused about what's supposed to be the right verb in that context, but here we go, right at the beginning, we've got a sibilant. Um, if I can close it off there, so let's mark that with, cap with a capital S for sibilant. Uh, and then there also appears to be one here in the middle, right? Uh, which goes by more quickly, but we still have this high intensity energy at the high frequencies there. Uh, so we'll mark that one off with an S. Uh, which kind of sibilants are we dealing with, do you think? Um, so uh, this one appears to be voiceless. There's nothing going on down here at the bottom, right? Um, so that one seems to be voiceless. This one appears to have some voicing. So I guess we'll make that capital Z. Um, it also goes by more quickly. So uh, a subtle point I mentioned somewhere down the line, or I hope I mentioned, is that uh, normally voiced obstruents tend to be shorter in duration than voiceless obstruents. It's difficult to voice an obstruent for any length of time, so it's easier if you simply make it shorter. Uh, that can depend, though, on a lot of other factors, but all other things being equal, you'll tend to have shorter voiced sibilants than voiceless sibilants. Which ones are we dealing with here? Which kind of sibilant? Um, this is also um, the cutoff between the high intensity and the low intensity is still relatively high here. Um, a little bit lower than what we've seen before, but again, for a post alveolar um, fricative, you'd expect it to be around 1500, 2000 hertz or something like that. This one is still around 3000 hertz. So it's up there. Uh, so I'm gonna guess that this first one is an S and this second one is a Z, like that. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, as usual, we've got some uh, vocalic stretches, um, which will help us out eventually, but we've also got a number of interruptions here, which look like voiceless stops, right? So we've definitely got a voiceless stop here where there's nothing going on. Uh, this one's kind of funny, actually, I'll, I'll point out, maybe we'll zoom in so you can see this a little bit better, uh, but there hardly seems to be a release burst for this guy at all. It's clearly a stop, but there's hardly a release burst. There's just something really faint here. So what's up with that? Um, I can kind of also corroborate that um, this F2 transition is pointing down into it. This is uh, kind of a classic patterns, pattern of what we'd expect to get if this were a bilabial stop, a voiceless bilabial like pa. And it's coming right after an S at the beginning of um, the whole utterance, so uh, we'd expect it to be unaspirated here anyways, because uh, in this context, you don't get any distinction between like a P and a B, but we'll just transcribe it as a voiceless P. Uh, and then we also have a stop right after that short vowel. This is our much more intense release burst for this guy. Um, it's voiceless. Uh, and then I'll point out, if you look what happens at what happens right before it, uh, F2, which was pointing down into this one, it goes up and it merges with F3 there. And we've got this nice solid release burst as well. It's um, maybe not what we're used to seeing for, uh, yeah, maybe not what we're used to seeing exactly for velar stops, but um, it's intense at least. So let's say this one is a K, like that. Um, and actually I'll point out, um, this is a little bit funny because we are getting more intensity here in this release burst, kind of like what we'd normally see for a sibilant um, up at this range. We're getting kind of this drop off here uh, where we don't have any energy at the bottom. Um, so that's typical of a T. Uh, and again, I'm kind of cheating for this, but it looks like we've got something like a KT going on in there where we go into a K and then we end up coming out in a T. What's up with that? Um, We've got what looks like a voice stop here. And here we get a release burst, which is more typical for uh, velars. So F2 and F3, I don't know if you can see that, but they're kind of coming together. It's hard to see the transitions, but you can definitely see the voice in here at the bottom. And we get this sort of um, a bit of a phantom formant here where we'd expect F2 and F3 to come together. And we get this intensity, this sort of compact intensity 
in the release burst of this guy rather than a more diffuse release burst like we get for this one or especially the P. Uh, so this looks like a more classic velar kind of stop, but it's voiced, right? Um, so let's say that's a G like that. Um, moving right along, we've got lots of things to pick out here that makes our lives simpler. We've got a nasal here of some sort. You can see this pattern, the low frequency broad F1, fainter, higher performance, and this sort of nice clear um, switch off of the intensity going from the vowel part here to the nasal part here. Um, what is that? Uh, well, it's a nasal of some sort. We can also see F2 points down nice and clearly here going into it. We can maybe guess that this is an M. Uh, because F2 is going to point down going into bilabial stops or nasals, right? Uh, all right, this is getting surprisingly simple. Who would have ever thought? Um, another really prominent cue here is what's going on with F3. So I don't know if you noticed that, um, but here's a vocalic stretch, but right before it, we got this sort of dramatic drop in F3. Um, and we'll maybe cut it off like right around there or so. And since I have this phonetic font set over here, I might as well use it. Uh, so it looks like we've got an er there of some sort. And I actually just noticed over here at the end, uh, F3 drops down uh, precipitously as well. So maybe around here, uh, we can cut this off and say, well, that's another er. Cool, huh? That one just jumps right out once you see it. Um, we've got a few vowels here, which are relatively short. Um, this one goes on for a longer period of time. It has some nasalization fuzziness, which makes it a little bit hard to identify, but we've got an F1 about seven, 10 Hertz around there, and an F2 looking in the middle of this whole thing of about 16, 62 Hertz. So this is a low vowel. The F2 is, or sorry, F1 is higher than 500 Hertz. So it's a low vowel and it's a frontish vowel as well. So this F2 is about 1700 Hertz. So not as front as like an E, um, but still front. We've got a low front vowel. I think a good guess for this one might be that guy. Um, yeah, so maybe you're already starting to pick things out of this uh, whole utterance here, looking across the board, uh, and the hint was phonetic reality. Who knows? Um, so let's keep rolling. We haven't looked too much at the last bit of this. Um, I'll zoom out a little bit. Uh, we've got clearly another stop here of some sort it's voiceless obviously because there's no voicing at the bottom also a big clue is that we've got this he looking thing right after it which extends for a long period of time so this is almost definitely aspiration right uh, and in that aspiration we actually see clues to the identity of this stop as well um, so uh, we've got kind of a series of release bursts right here um, one two three pops uh, and their um, intensity is most prominent here, uh, kind of at this range. Um, so it's not diffusely spread out across the whole board for these release bursts. It's compact in this range. You can kind of see maybe F2 and F3 coming together here. It's a little confused by the fact that this is coming out of an er. Uh, so it's not what we normally expect to get, but this is uh, in short, a velar stop, a voiced velar stop. Um, what do we have here at the end? Uh, it looks like a long vowel um, and things tend to get longer at the ends of utterances. Uh, so maybe this is just really an extended out vowel of some sort. F1 is low, it's about 340 Hertz. F2 is low as well, it's like 860. We've got two low formant frequencies that puts us in the high back corner of the vowel space. Um, and I'll point out here as well, F3 is changing a little bit as we go. It kind of goes up here by the end, but it stays pretty low at the beginning. We don't normally look at F3, but um, there's a bit of a shift going on there. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to transcribe this as an OO. Um, yeah. So we're getting close here to maybe just being able to see the pattern. Maybe you've seen it already in class. If you had, I will give you a donut. Um, try to think of another reward uh, I can give you instead of that because we're social distancing. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe you can already solve the puzzle. In fact, I'm gonna guess you already did. 
Um, I'll just go through these other two um, valves here though. So this one is 622 hertz. That's a lowish valve, a little bit higher than 500. This is around 1500, so it's kind of mid-ish. Uh, it turns out this valve is an epsilon. Um, and then we're missing this one. Uh, and this is a short vowel, which is kind of influenced by its context because it's not um, uh, that long. And so you kind of just go through a transition there. Uh, this is maybe a little bit different from what you might expect. This is going to wind up being a schwa. Um, so normally you expect, at least for a speaker like me, this should be about 500 hertz for F1 or about 1500 hertz for uh, F2 uh, for a schwa. Uh, F2 gets pushed up a little bit here because it goes straight into um, kind of the, well, it goes from the transition for the T. So it wants to point into about 1700 hertz for the T. And then it also wants to um, uh, pinch up together with the F3 for the G right after it. So it's a little bit higher than normal. Uh, it's because of the influence of the con uh, consonants around it. Normally in um, English, if you're looking at an English spectrogram, uh, you, uh, if you see a schwa, it's going to be very short. And it's going to be hard to identify in kind of a classic schwa fashion, like a clear 500, 1500, 2500 hertz pattern for the formants. Uh, if you just see a really short vowel, you can kind of guess it's probably a schwa or just an unstressed vowel of some sort. Uh, I'm also going to point out here that, um, well, if you haven't figured this out yet, uh, the whole phrase is spectrograms are cool. Um, and I'll just put in my little ah here for the moment. It's This one's going to be rotisized. It's going to be ah. We've got... Um, well, a little bit of a highish F1, a little bit of a lowish F2, and then F3 comes down to sit on top of it. So it's not our classic ah either because we've got um, the er anticipation right after it. And kind of the funny part of this that's hard to see is where the ooh turns into an L. Uh, do I have a velarized L? Yes, I do. Thank you, Paul Boersma, for being awesome. All right, so there we, this is the velarized L here. It looks almost indistinct from the ooh before it, except it kind of fades out a little bit in intensity, basically. Uh, but that's hard to pick up. Um, so we can, why don't we listen to the whole thing? I haven't played it yet. Spectrograms are cool. And this is where uh, you find out I just said spectrograms as opposed to spectrograms. It's not easy. Spectrograms are cool. Uh, so this is maybe the ooh part of this. Cool. Yeah. Probably go into L well before that, maybe around here. Bull, 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 bull. Something like that. Um, yeah, so this is the cool part. Cool. Yeah, maybe we'll leave it at that. Uh, hopefully, you figured that one out before I got to the end. Um, and if you didn't, um, I think I'm probably going to try to put together a few more practice exercises before next Wednesday. Uh, okay, so that's it for now.